Hello, and welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind Our Friends. We'd like to thank our, our friends at Gravitas Ventures, as well as Meryl Katz at Nardi Inc. and the team at IDPR for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. Claudia Puig is president of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association and longtime critic on NPR's Film Week. She has a film cultural consulting business and was USA Today's film critic for 15 years and an LA Times staff writer for 11 years. She was recently featured in an LA Times article as one of 14 critics making media more inclusive. Welcome Claudia, welcome panelists, and please Claudia, take it away. Thanks a lot, Kyle. I'm really happy to be here today with uh, the three producers of our friend, Michael Press, Ryan Stoll, and Teddy Schwartzman. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I wanted to, I, I'm so uh, glad that your film explores what it means to be a true friend uh, in the darkest of times. And, you know, we're in some pretty dark times right now. So it's really uplifting to see something that is about something inspiring. And, um, it really shines a light on the importance of friendship, compassion, empathy. We just don't see movies like this much. Uh, you know, the old cliche, we don't see them like this anymore, but it's, you know, small scale human stories set around extraordinary friendships. So thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you particularly, Mike and Ryan, I give the two of you, um, what spawned your interest in taking Matthew Teague's award-winning essay uh, that was in Esquire about love and death, about his personal experiences, about his wife. What, what gave you the idea to make that into a film? I'm sorry, I said Mike and Ryan. Uh, yeah, Mike and Ryan, sorry. Mike? Shall I start, Ryan? Yeah. Um, well, I'd actually followed Matt Teague's work as uh, a journalist. I was familiar with him. Um, he'd written in The Guardian, obviously substantially in The New Yorker. And it, I just always liked his work and sort of just kept an eye on him. I wrote a very interesting piece on uh, Northern Ireland, which was of interest to me some years ago. Um, and I think it was in 2015, I read Matt's uh, article entitled The Friend in the Squire. And it just moved me uh, profoundly when I read it. And on a personal note, I think, you know, when I was 25, uh, I went through uh, a very sudden uh, and tragic loss that had affected me and naturally sort of continues to affect me. And I remember the people uh, that sort of helped me through that experience and sort of what it meant to me to sort of come, come back after that. And um, Brad Inglesby uh, is also an, an old friend of mine. We went to film school together and we have a deep friendship. And so when I read this, I thought, oh, I should send this to Brad Inglesby, who's also interested in these things and is a friend. And that's how it began. And we just started, we really just started talking about um, how you come through adversity um, and who those people are that help you through it and sort of really change your life. And the people that are there and the people sometimes that aren't there, um, what that sort of does to you um, as a human and sort of how you learn not just about them, but you know, really yourself and what you're capable of uh, and you're capable of overcoming. Um, so it spoke to me uh, in a very profound way. And so I, I immediately uh, contacted Matthew. Um, I reached out to him and we had a, uh, many conversations early on about grief and loss and sort of the journey, um, you know, that those things uh, put us through and, and, you know, and really sort of coming to terms um, with uh, post grief of sort of how you live your life again. And we sort of also talked about losing people in our lives that we had loved very young. Uh, mine was my brother when he was 18 um, in a tragic accident. Matthew's obviously was his wife at age 34, uh, which was tragic. So we had long conversations about that. And he said to me, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to uh, give this, this story up yet. He said, it's so fresh to me and it's so personal to me. And obviously, if I was to sort of trust this with someone, it, 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 it's a huge step for me, you know, as this is my life. And um, I, you know, of course, I said to him, no, I completely understand that. And uh, if this isn't the time, I fully, you know, respect that. And, you know, I hope you carry on healing um, in, your, in your life. And so he called me a week later 
and said, uh, Mike, you know, thanks for the, all the chats. It was, you know, quite, you know, that I enjoyed the therapy. And he said, I hope you did as well. But uh, he said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to tell the story. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not going to give it away to anyone else. I just want you to know that um, this isn't the time. And so I said, oh, of course, I understand. So uh, about a, a year went by. And then um, I think it was sort of towards the end of 2016, uh, my chronology may be slightly off, so forgive me. Uh, Matt reached out and he said, uh, enough time has passed and uh, I would like to tell um, my story and Nicole's story now and what it means to be a friend. And he said a lot of producers actually have reached out um, to me since the article published, but um, I think your connection to grief and the conversations we've had make me feel uh, comfortable that we can go on this journey together. So just to tie it, uh, tie it back. Uh, so I then called Brad Inglesby again, who had obviously loved the article. And he said he was still interested. And immediately, obviously, we then went about sort of talking to Matt and uh, really, you know, going into the sort of uh, the details of, of life before and after uh, Nicole's passing. So we built the, we wanted to build it around the notion of, of, of friendship. Yes. Well, I was that was a very long answer. No, no, no. It, it was a very <laughs> thorough answer. We appreciate that. Um, I was interested in, in sort of the process maybe if, that you had and that Matt had with Brad Inglesby because uh, Matt being a writer and having lived this experience, I wondered if he had a hand in the script or, or oversaw it in any way. And I know he's got an executive producer credit um, or were you sort of the middle person there? How did that all come together? No, Matt, Matt was involved in the script in every step of the way. He didn't, you know, physically write it himself, but every part of the journey, you know, Matt was, you know, we, we, we didn't just, you know, want his support. We needed it um, because only it was only him that was sort of really able to, I think, give us certain insights, you know, that, that were... Um, that were singular to him. So Brad spent a vast amount of time with Matt, with Dane, with the Teague family, just really immersing himself in uh, their life um, and sort of, and, and, and not just, you know, what happened, but why it happened. Um, and I think it was, you know, that commitment from Teddy, uh, Ryan, myself, all throughout was, you know, this, this has to be a story that um, you know, is, is completely honest to the experience um, of sort of, of Matt's life. So he, uh, he, he was, his, his uh, imprint is in, you know, every part of the, uh, the film and, and was every part of the journey. And Ryan, uh, I saw you nodding there about it being uh, extremely authentic to his experience. What, tell us about your part in it. Uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to have come on to this project um, I joined uh, Scott Free in 2017 and Mike had already had this in development, actually Kevin Walsh. Um, and I had come uh, at the same time about, and we had just uh, come off of working on Manchester by the Sea. So in reading the script and kind of having this prestige character driven quality to it, um, you know, we were immediately uh, drawn to it and then the, you know, the thought of working with Katie, you know, of working with Casey again was uh, also a draw for us. So, um, yeah, I, I was, you know, I was lucky to have come in. And I think the, you know, the, the, the greatest thing was that we were able to kind of bring a lot of the crew that we had worked with um, in Boston on several projects, Manchester included down to Alabama, uh, as there was a lack of local crew at the time. Uh, so we kind of rounded up the gang uh, along with, uh, you know, people that Black Bear had worked with as well and, uh, and had a, a, an incredible crew come down uh, and work with us down in uh, Fairhope. Well, you mentioned Casey Affleck, um, and I wanted to ask Teddy, the three main characters are so good in their roles. Uh, they, they elevate the movie, we believe them. Um, how did their casting come about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, we were we were approached by by Mike and Ryan and, and Kevin Walsh um, and and Gab, our our fearless director, who all of whom we knew well in different ways, um, but had yet to actually collaborate on a project. Um, and at the time, they were looking for 
uh, financing for the project and if it was the right fit, another producing partner. But um, between Mike and Kevin and Ryan, um, they're all great producers in and of their own rights. Um, but it just happened that we all clicked and um, had a shorthand from the beginning. Uh, so I got involved alongside the great work that they had already done developing the script and they had already started a bit of the packaging process. Um, so um, Jason Siegel, uh, what, you know, I believe was the only person that the script was sent to, um, to play the role of Dane. And uh, he responded right away um, with, um, with some level of apprehension, given the fact that it's a real person who um, is quite humble. And, um, you know, to this day, Dane is, uh, a real supporter of the project, but also doesn't want to do interviews and doesn't want to be, uh, doesn't want to turn this into, um, you know, a, a parade of gratitude for what he did for the Teague family. Mm -hmm. And I think we all believed that Jason combined that level of heart and humor and dramatic depth, um, but that this wasn't um, going to be a, a, you know, it wasn't a script that was developed um, to be an exploration of pain and death. It was a celebration of uh, a, a family, of love, uh, an acceptance of loss, and about um, a coming together during the hardest of times, which obviously couldn't be more appropriate to sort of the world that we're living in right now. And I think Jason sort of embodied everything that we were looking for in Dane, and I think has given one of the more nuanced performances of a, an outstanding career that he's ever given. Um, Dakota, and I, I'm sorry not to be going in reverse order, but um, Dakota, um, um, Dakota just has this sparkle and light and life. Um, and yet she also has a level of intelligence, um, of presence and, and, a, and a maternal nature, despite the fact that she's quite young, um, that, um, that I think really embodied who Nicole was, right, as, as the anchor within the Teague family who kept everything together and full of life and light, um, especially while Matt had to spend a great deal of time traveling as, um, you know, a, as a, a correspondent who would be overseas for months on end at times. Um, and I think she's given um, just her most mature, most powerful and um, just, just wonderful performance. And we were lucky to, to be partnered with her on it. And, uh, and then the third piece of casting, which is actually, you know, arguably a lead role, although frankly, they're all three, the leads, um, was who was gonna play Matt Teague. And, um, and, and Kevin and Ryan had, had worked with uh, Casey on Manchester by the Sea. Um, I had just produced Casey's directing debut, uh, Light of My Life. Um, and so we all had um, a very, um, great relationship um, that frankly just allowed us to know what an exceptional actor he is um, and having just won the Academy Award um, you know there's there's no arguing that Casey is one of the best actors alive today and so the fact that we could have this this ensemble um, all of whom had very different energies um, but uh, all of whom actually knew each other independently um, liked each other and wanted to collaborate. Um, we just happened to find a, an organic story where, uh, where they could shine in different ways than they have before. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I was intrigued by the fact that the story is told non-chronologically in the sort of fractured narrative um, and jumps back and forth in time. How did the decision come about to tell it in that way? Was that Bryant's decision or was that uh, Gabriella's decision or a joint decision with all of you? How did that about um i'll ask michael since i saw you not it was a conscious decision um early on because when when i first sent brad the article he he loved it he just he said to me you know i wonder uh the the best way to tell the story he said i don't think it's going to be a linear path because he said i think if we tell this in a chronological way inexorably the film sort of just be, it becomes about a woman who is passing and who is ill and then passes and he said I think you it becomes sort of an unavoidable axiomatic truth and he said I, I don't want the film to sort of just be that he said that isn't the film the film should be about sort of the the nature 
um, of friendship. And he said, often, I think when we recall events in our lives, they come to us in nonlinear ways, you know, sort of time becomes, you know, something that we never quite have a grasp of. And, you know, we sort of have shards of memory and understanding that really uh, sort of, you know, make up uh, the memories of these experiences that we go through, uh, especially looking back. And so I said to him, well, that sounds wonderful. How are we going to do it? And he said, I think, you know, we, we, what we have to do is, is do something that, uh, he said, I don't ever want it to feel sort of like we're taking away from the emotional crux of the piece. But he said, I think there are ways to do it where we can sort of very naturally and seamlessly sort of shift between time periods that really sort of enhance and augment uh, the emotion of the piece rather than detract from it. So uh, yes, it was a, a, a very conscious decision up front that uh, Brad came up with, uh, you know, I supported and then Matthew uh, himself thought was also an outstanding uh, idea and I think actually uh, was something that um, he you know he hadn't thought about but was actually very grateful and happy that we sort of proceeded in that way. It definitely does take the focus away from the eventual death it just uh, one of the things that I love is is that uh, I guess Gabriella's commitment and the cast commitment to make these real human beings a bigger part than the story of the disease. The disease, of course, is part of it, but it's their sense of life and friendship and their bond that we remember more than the details of the disease. Um, but I wondered if it was, I would think tone with this kind of a film is really difficult to achieve. You know, you can, you don't want to stray into sentimentality or mawkishness and you wanna, um, you know, but at the same time, you don't wanna make light of it. So uh, was that something that you all talked about? And, and I would think that would be a challenge, uh, Ryan. Yeah, I, I definitely think it was something that we all kind of discussed from the get go. Um, and, and when we partnered with Teddy and they, they Teddy and, and Mike and um, team of Black Bear uh, really like understood Gab's vision for this. I mean, Gab comes from uh, a documentarian background. So she, you know, she did Blackfish and um, and has a real level of, 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 of rawness to her filmmaking. And so we, you know, we, we wanted to kind of uh, address that in a way that was, um, that was really making this an authentic portrayal of these three friends that had gone through this. And, uh, and I think finding a delicate balance in between the, the source material, the article, which is, be somewhat dour and uh, and uh, finding kind of the the balance in between that uh, that brought out the you know the comedy and the relationships and uh, I think you know Gab and uh, our editor Colin and the actors um, you know all contributed in doing that and, and kind of bringing that out in the piece. I wanted to go back to something that Teddy, you were talking about in the performances, because I agree. I think this was Jason Siegel's best performance and he's had some really winning performances. I thought it seems like a really smart decision to cast someone like him because he has that everyman charm and that likable charisma. Um, and he can, we've seen that he can do dramatic, obviously, um, having played David Foster Wallace. And then we've seen, you know, he can obviously, you know, we know he can do humor, but I love that he, we see this kind of, reliability, the sense of patience and, and uh, sort of stability in, even though he himself is struggling obviously with his own uh, demons, but um, you know, his capacity for friendship and love was really, it really struck me. It's like, we should all have a friend like, like Dane. Um, I wondered yeah. how much- I was gonna say, and, and, and if I have any friends who are watching right now, I'll let them know you, you're just as good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> same here, same here. All our okay. friends agree. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I think I think that also ties back to, you know, Brad's intention, Matt's intention in adapting this, uh, and what you said earlier, right, which is, um, you know, we can talk about the heaviness of the eventuality of this movie, but that's not the point. There's a number of, um, you know, melodramatic films that get made that are focused on pain and suffering and intent on making you cry, right? Um, I think what, what we loved so much about reading this script and exploring this story was that it made you laugh naturally 
it made you cry naturally. Um, it was grounded and based in reality. And, and through that, um, that nonlinear structure explored what it means to go through a marriage, to have a family and watch as your children grow up or not be able to watch as certain events transpire, um, to watch as friendships fade and then reconnect and then um, really see what people are made of when you need the most, you know? Um, and it also was a really interesting exploration that, that you rarely see in film um, of, of male friendship. Um, it's also a beautiful, um, you know, male female friendship between, um, between Dane and, and Nicole Teague. Um, but you also rarely get to see, um, you know, a, a naturalistic male friendship, uh, you know, that's devoid of machismo uh, that really shows um, how much we all rely upon each other in different times. And, um, and I think, you know, going back to what you said from a Jason standpoint, you know, I think he so naturally is able to find uh, elements of, of humor that come up on a conversational level, you know, whether, whether it's um, a line here or there while sitting in a hospital room, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, an ad lib that he would just do during a, you know, a, a stand up routine that he and uh, Dakota were practicing. Um, but none of it comes from shtick, right? Uh, it all comes from relatability and, and humanity and humility. Um, and I think it allows us uh, to go through the journey of our friend and not feel like, oh, why do we have to watch a cancer movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but to watch this movie and say, this is unlocking the best values of our humanity right now and showing us what we all have in common and what we share and what we love and what's important. And I think um, to, have, to have an actor like Jason to sort of anchor that and be our conduit into this family, um, gosh, we're so lucky because you're right. He gave tremendous performances, you know, and end of the tour and so many other movies um, where we can just relate to him. Um, and I think he brings us in here into a world that you might think you don't want to spend time in. And yet you have to be there and you want to be there. And it means so much to the viewer and to this family to, to, to be able to have that insight and that help. Yeah. I, and I would add to that and say also, you know, like, you know, in, tragedy there is humor and there's often unexpected humor in it and you know I, I think we've all experienced that in life and I think you know the intent I think some one of us said this in Toronto you know we never set out to make Amour by Michael Haneke as much as we love you know all of us love that film and have seen it we sort of set out to do something you know as Teddy said that was um, about the the sort of transcendental nature of, of, of friendship and sort of adversity brings out sometimes um, very, very, you know, the, the best in people, it really does. And as we saw with, you know, with Dane, uh, it really brought out the best in him. It gave him a purpose that was yeah. unfulfilled and he, you know, he achieved it uh, and surpassed that. And it, it put, sort of put his, his life on another track. It's interesting you bring up Amour by Michael Haneke because I did see a review where somebody said, you know, Amour about Michael Haneke explores this, you know, on a deeper level. It's like, well, these people lived a, a lifetime together. So that's a very different story than somebody who's snuffed out early and, you know, and has children. And, you know, it's just a different, completely different story. And, you know, we can't all live out <laughs> the ideal sort of or, or whatever someone considers, you know, sort of this. Um, well, I think, I think they're also just... Um... They're different starting points in what yeah. what the what films want to explore, right? There are some exceptional movies and some um, exploitative movies that explore death. Um, this really isn't a movie that explores death, right. it explores right. life, life and, yeah. and friendship um, and community and friendship, um, while having a catalyst of something tremendously painful that um, that everyone needs to go through together. You know, so. Um, you know, for us, you know, look, you know, it's, it's, maybe it's, um, what's the right way of saying it, you know, three, three sensitive men sitting around talking about um, beaches and terms of endearment as, as our comps, you know, um, but, but those really are the types of movies that 
used to be wide release major studio films that were part of the shared communal experience of cinema. Um, and it wasn't, um, it, it was because we understood how much um, we learned from each other and how much uh, friendships, relationships, family, struggles were something that was that communal bond that we all go through regardless of our differences. And so I think those were, um, Gab obviously had, you know, much more cinematic uh, highfalutin comps than, than what I'm throwing out to you. But I think, um, I think we haven't had a, a beaches for our generation. And that's, that to me and, and to my wife and to the people who have seen this movie is, is what this can be. And what, you know, is something that can really impact our, our, our country right now and help us understand that we have each other and we will get through our darkest of times together. Absolutely. I was really intrigued also. I mean, we see the wonderful chemistry of friendship and I, and I don't think we've seen movies that in which you see a couple and a friend, you know, in the same way. Um, so we see the wonderful friendship between the three adults. But what I also liked was the bond between Dane and the girls. I thought that there was so much lovely chemistry between those girls and him and how he made them laugh. And, um, you know, he was the fun uncle or, you know, uh, he, he was able to do things that, that obviously Matt was not able to do in some ways, either just being there or just goofing around. Um, and I wondered how much of that was just Jason's kind of natural charm. Was there a bond that you saw developing on set? And Ryan, I see you nodding. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, Jason's just such an affable guy. I mean, it, he really is. He's the sweetest human being. He, he's so wildly talented and, um, you know, greets everyone with a smile. Like he couldn't go two steps in Fairhope without somebody wanting to <laughs> take a picture with him. And, and, and he does it all um, with aplomb. And, and he brought the same quality to the set with uh, Isabella and Violet where, I think that some of that playfulness in real life comes out through Dane and they really responded to him where, um, where Dane really came in and started to look after the girls. And um, I, I think that the, the girls kind of sparked to this warmth and um, even just, I'm think I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking of this day that we were shooting the call me maybe scene where they're singing in the car and they were just having an absolute blast because, uh, of the scene itself, but also <laughs> Jason didn't, Jason doesn't know the real lyrics. So he was just making stuff up. So here you are <laughs> having Jason Siegel just improv and the girls in the back are just having the time of their lives. And um, and Gabriella like sees that opportunity to really like bring out the moment in, in what we were trying to capture in that connection where he was, he was becoming the, you know, Uncle Buck character to them where he didn't, you know, he didn't have kids of his own, but stepped into the role and was willing to help out his, uh, his good friends to do so. So, yeah, I think it was, um, it was very organic and natural in the way it developed. Um, I wanted to ask you, Michael, because you alluded to, you know, having gone through a, your personal a, a situation of grief when you were quite young. Um, one of the things that I really was intrigued by was sort of the question about friendship through trauma and how do you know who's going to stick around? You know, I saw this when my mother was, was passing away that one her closest friend couldn't stand to see her in, in a, you know, a death store. She just would come and, you know, not come in the door and just ask me. And I, you know, we've all known of people who just either disappear or they can't, they have their own issues. Um, and we tend to focus on people who turn up and the people who are there, but we don't think about the people, you know, the honest way in which Nicole talks about people who weren't there. Um, and I was interested in that, uh, exploring that. Because um, that seems like a, a, a maybe trickier thing to explore on film. Yeah, I think it, you know, it, it's something that we all talked about, you know, as a creative team from the beginning. Um, and, you know, obviously something that we talked about during the shoot, all of us. I mean, you can't help but bring your own personal 
experiences sometimes to these things. I mean, everybody goes through loss at different times in their life. Um, it's never easy. Um, and, you know, I think that when, when we were sort of talking about, especially with Matt, you know, we were talking about people that sometimes through maybe no fault of their own, do not have the emotional capability or bandwidth to really look tragedy in the eye. And it is a very, you know, it is a really difficult thing. And I think from that, what you don't want to do is sort of start assigning blame. And we talked about, you know, we talked about that as well, because it's so easy to say, oh, you weren't there for me, or, you know, you didn't turn up. But when sort of the ground shakes and moves underneath you, uh, as it does in loss and grief, and you try and understand it, um, I think there is a beauty in, in suddenly finding people that do surprise you and you're like goodness I never thought that person was capable of that and there is a melancholy in seeing people that you had hoped you know would hold on to you when you feel like you're falling you know not be there and I think what the film does in a very elegant way and a, you know credit to Gab you know to your point about the tone of the film is it celebrates Jason uh, Jason's character of Dane but it also doesn't shy away from the fact that not everybody um, you know, can understand that journey and you, and you see that. And, and also not everybody can articulate it. I mean, I think, you know, Jake Owen's character in the film is, you know, somebody who does care, but he has such a sort of awkward way of, of being able to sort of express that, you know? And I think not everybody wants to and not everybody can do, but that doesn't invalidate their own experience, uh, if that makes sense. So I think that was something we all found very, you know, a, a, a common understanding in. And, and as I said, throughout the whole creative team, we, we shared our own uh, experiences in, in helping us reach that conclusion. I appreciated that. And also just in, in general, because it's sort of the warts and all look at life. Um, you know, we saw uh, that maybe uh, Matt wasn't there enough. And then we saw that uh, Nicole had had an affair and so we saw them as full humans not they weren't sanctified or you know exalted in any way which movies sometimes do they make the person dying particularly you know perfect um, so that was an interesting thing did again did Matt have any um, hesitation in any of that or, or was that something he embraced wholeheartedly well in the article um, obviously it's actually not it's not talked about Nicole's uh, you know Nicole's affair and, you know, obviously Matt was writing for a word limit in the article. So one of the things that Brad Inglesby really, you know, I think in his exploration with Matt about, you know, the full portrait, as you said, of his family and, and what had happened, not, not, you know, we weren't cherry picking. We never wanted to cherry pick and sort of say, well, this should go here. He's, you know, I think he realized early on that the, you know, Nicole's uh, affair for that period of time, which really had been obviously, you know, brought about by Matt's neglects, frankly, and I think he would be the first to, you know, to acknowledge that, um, was a hugely, it was revelatory, you know, for the, um, you know, for the film, and it was revelatory for Matt and his life for Nicole, and then obviously became such a, you know, integral part of, you know, of, of, uh, of the film. So I think, yes, warts and all is a good way of, of, of describing it because, you know, you can't, uh, I, I think we never set out to sort of, as, as Teddy alluded to and Ryan said as well, you know, we never wanted to sort of make this a purpose-built film. You know, it was something that sort of, I think you share the, you, you share the whole roller coaster ride. Right. Um, and for, oh, for I, I would just echo that that reveal in the film in particular was a very sensitive one um, for for Matt, for us, for Gab, and what you know, um, and even through the editorial process, was something that Gab was I don't want to say wrestling with, um, but but that we wanted to make sure that we weren't being disrespectful in any way, shape, or form, um, that we weren't. Um, uh, we weren't providing the wrong legacy for Nicole, um, um, but that we also were importantly embracing the fact that life is messy and relationships are messy and, um, and we have to remember the warts and all uh, in order to fully appreciate all the experiences that we've had together. And, um, 
And I think, you know, to that end, we calibrated certain moments there of how much was in the film, certain scenes that didn't actually end up in the film because they felt um, like they might be pushing further into the melodrama that we all wanted to avoid. Um, but we also thought it was important to not sugarcoat the complexity of relationships. Um, I wanted to ask you one last question, um, and that is about the very deeply moving scene where uh, Matt tells the girls mom is going to die. And, um, you know, they were avoiding all the mom's going away, mom's going to, you know, all those things. And I thought that was sounds so heavy. It's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uplifting, joyous film. <laughs> it is. There's so many moments of that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I wondered if there were tears on set or if that was something that everybody was able to, you know, uh, you know, to... How, how did that scene, the shooting of that scene go down? Ryan, I'll ask you. Uh, there, there were a lot of tears on set. Um, I, I think in fact that uh, we had talked to Matt about the language that, um, that the doctors had actually given in Mike or Teddy, maybe you can back me up on that, but I think that there was some, some consultation. So we had the, the, the language right and um, it was palpable. Um, I, it struck a chord for me because, um, uh, because my mother had been, uh, had been in a similar situation, not terminal, but with cancer. And uh, I had been in the room with her and her friends when she was getting chemo. And so uh, it, it, <laughs> it tapped into a, a piece of my soul that uh, was really, um, was really shattering, and uh, it it was it was not easy to get through uh, on set. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, Gabriella and the and the actors handled it, you know um, handled it um, just perfectly. Um, I agree. Yeah. I think testament to that, Ryan, is the fact that when Matt watched the film, he said, "This is right. This is this oh. is this is true." He said, "This is honest, and this is." I, I bless this, you know, this is, this is how it, this is my life. And I think, you know, what, what better compliment in some ways, you know, to, to uh, you, can you have than uh, the person who lived it to say, you know, to say, thank you. Well, I'll reiterate that the film is also filled with joyous and life affirming moments too, along with all of this. So, um, and I'm guessing that everybody who's watching this has seen film, so they know that. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Michael, Ryan, and Teddy, thank you so much for, um, for all your insight and uh, thank you for the film. Thank you, Claudia, for having us. My thank you so much. Really appreciate the time and sorry for your loss and thank you for sharing and thanks to everybody here for watching. <laughs>